Hello, everyone. Welcome to Content Marketing Marathon Part 2. Uh, my name is Kate. Uh, give me, please, just one minute. I need to add our speakers to, um, to talk. Just a second. Um, I see Chris is here. And Alessandra. And we're just waiting for Neil. Hi, Chris. Hey, Kate. How's it going? Great, going great. And I don't see Hi, Alessandra. Hi. Let's wait for him. Um, in the meantime, can you please let us know if you can hear us well, if you can see us, so everything is working perfectly in the chat. If anyone can send please a message. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thanks. Yeah, I see Neil. So just a second. Thank you, Ali. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Neil. Hey, everyone. Hi. So uh, before we start, uh, I just will do just a short uh, announcement to this series. So you know, this is a, a series uh, of free events. The first event we did last Thursday. Uh, it was about content analytics with Andy Christodine and Kasper Rasmussen. In case uh, you missed it, uh, don't worry, I will send the recording to that event uh, along with the recording for this one tomorrow, so don't worry. And today we will talk about one of the hottest topics, I think, is the international SEO. And we have a fantastic experts here, and I will let Chris, you, to introduce to make an introduction to our experts and to yourself. And I'm here if you need anything, just call me. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen, start the slides. There we go. All right, so you should be seeing my slides. Okay, can you confirm that you can see the slides? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So my name is Chris Ralph. Uh, I'll quickly introduce myself in a second here. We're going to talk about what makes strong international SEO. It truly is a hot topic. Um, and there is no international SEO without content. Uh, so I'm super excited to have Alessandra and Neil here with me today uh, before we introduce ourselves. Uh, this is what we're going to try to pack into this short hour here. Uh, quickly, you know, meet us, then the 30,000 foot uh, overview of international SEO. Then we'll um, uh, have an expert roundtable discussion, talk about some interesting topics here. Then we'll do game time uh, and then hopefully make sure, you know, uh, send questions through the Q&A feature there. Uh, we're here to answer any questions you may have. And then uh, the best question gets a book conclusion and closing out the session with a bang. So that being said, my name is Chris Ralph. I'm the founder of Boulder SEO Marketing. Uh, started this company initially as a local SEO company. I'm a, as you can hear from the accent, uh, I'm, I'm actually Swiss. Uh, soon, this local SEO company turned into a national SEO company and then an international SEO company because of my background. Uh, um, I now live in Colorado. Absolutely love it here. Um, I've been in digital marketing for about two decades. Uh, you, I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, shoot me an email if you have any other questions. That being said, I recently spoke with Alessandra in San Francisco, and we actually spoke about this topic, which is really cool. Uh, so I'm very excited to be speaking with you again about this uh, very same topic. Alessandra, if you want to quickly introduce yourself, please. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Really happy to be here and happy to um to talk about this topic with you again mm. uh it's always fun so it's nice to do it again um i don't have much of an accent but i am uh, born and raised in italy um i moved to the states though for college i was uh i went to university in boston 
And, you know, like many people in the localization world, I've hopped around quite a bit, spent about 10 years in the Caribbean. Um, I've been a, a globalization and localization consultant uh, for since 2016, but I've been in this field for um, over, about 15 years. Um, and uh, before that, mostly worked with, in international sales and marketing. So really in total, I have about two decades of international user advocacy. I am a board member of GALA, the Globalization and Localization Association, if you're familiar with that, uh, if you are a member. Uh, if you're not a member, you should be. And yeah, just a few quick uh contacts there if you want to if you want to get in touch and this is my first time having the pleasure to to speak about this topic with Neil so really looking forward to that Neil do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself yeah thanks Alessandra um so hey everyone I'm Neil Chef I'm based in London and I've got a bit of a strange background but I you know I had a career in investment banking and in the evenings and weekends for the last 15 years, I was launching sites using SEO and using content marketing and content strategy and, and pretty much fell in love with it uh, to the extent that in uh, six years ago, I decided to um, leave my career in finance to launch a, uh, an SEO agency called Bubbly Digital. Um, so founder of Bubbly Digital, as well as um, rightfully which is a copywriting and content creation service for brands so that's what i do by day and by evenings i'm usually uh, running around two little kids who are driving me mad um, but i'm still smiling at the end of it so that's that's what we do we've we've worked with chris in the past uh, multiple times on 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 a number of projects um, we tend to do anything from copyright and content creation to international seo to basic SEO as well. So um, yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell and looking forward to the chat that we've got coming up. Cool. And uh, Neil, right before the lockdown, remember we gave a webinar out of London, out of your office, and then I came back and then boom, two years later. Crazy, crazy. Wasn't it? <laughs> Here we are. All right. So um, a big question. So international SEO is pretty complex. It's, it's not that easy to implement and to be successful in. So why bother with international SEO? I mean, right there, according to this report, to this study here, uh, the average cost per lead, um, it, you know, if you look at SEO, it is the least expensive way to actually attract new potential customers. Hands down, at, at my company, that's all that we do. We do basically content marketing and SEO. I mean, it's sort of like uh, intertwined, right? It is the least expensive way to attract new customers. That's why we should do international SEO, in my opinion. Um, Alessandra, you have a little bit of a different background, uh, not, not extremely in SEO, but heavily in content, right? Consulting with big companies. How would you define in, if, you know, in a few sentences, what is content marketing for you? Oh boy, that's, that's a surprise question. Um, it's really to uh, create and uh, deploy content uh, that is engaging to the your target audience, and of course, in in the world of international, the target audience can vary quite a bit. So, uh, being able to create uh, a content marketing strategy that um, is uh, is engaging for different types of target audience is really important. So, it's not you know it's something that definitely needs a strong strategy behind it uh, and uh, and really good tactical execution. Absolutely. And then uh, Neil, I'm going to ask you the same question. As, as it, when we take on new clients, they all fail at content marketing, hands down. Uh, that's just the reality. So, uh, you know, as it relates to SEO, this is, it's all about content, right? Where we infuse SEO best practices into a powerful content marketing strategy. Neil, what is content marketing for you? 
Yeah, so um, content for me is, is really around what type of content do you, do you strategize and build that helps you, number one, demonstrate your expertise, number two, demonstrate your authority in the industry, and number three, um, make you a trustworthy brand. In other words, Google's eyes, we refer to that as EAT, Google's, Google's guideline refers to expertise, authority, trustworthiness. So content marketing, basically your content marketing strategy needs to solve those three. Now, the cool thing is the reason why SEO is always interlinked with content marketing is because people are often searching for problems and questions. And it, you know, the two, the, you can find questions that helps you to build more credibility, that helps you to come across authoritativeness. So if you add in the layer of visibility, i.e. SEO, then now you've got a content marketing strategy that not only helps you to do those three things, remember expertise, trustworthiness, and, and uh, an authority, but it also now allows you to become more visible. So you've got the three and you add the layer on top of SEO and you've suddenly got a powerful content strategy. That's kind of how I think about content marketing. Excellent, cool. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into uh, international SEO. Obviously, uh, you're not going to learn everything there is to know in this short webinar, but I think our attendees will get a great overview of you know how international uh, international SEO works fundamentally. All right, il posto migliore per nascandore un cadavere. Neil, the best ort um eine Leiche zu verstecken. The best place to hide a dead body. Common joke in the SEO world on page number two, right? Yeah. Um, Neil, can you talk, where do you need to rank if you want to get people to your website organically? Yeah, so... Um... The top three positions are the money positions. If you can get number one, you know, you, you've basically opened up your bank account. But the top three is, is as, you know, is where your aspirations should be. Um, ideally, if you're nowhere close, then actually just getting to page one will bring you traffic. And then over time, as you work hard and, and, and earn Google's trust, you want to get in that top three position. Yeah, so even the bottom of page one doesn't cut it. You really have to be in those uh, top three positions. Otherwise, the click-through rate is going to go down dramatically. All right, the best kept secret these days, um, it's Google's algorithm. All right, about, um, gosh, six, seven, eight months ago, it was a massive algorithm update that actually hit our, my own website, Boulder SEO Marketing. We lost, I would say, probably like 80% of all of our organic search traffic. Why? <laughs> we were so busy helping other people optimizing their website, right? So we completely neglected our own website. Don't worry, I'm not going to go over all of these things here, but this is, I basically had to sit down and in my head figure out how does SEO work fundamentally. So this is a very simplified version of how SEO works, like the strategy that we deploy for our customers. But there's basically a lot of things that you need to do. There's a lot of ranking signals in Google's algorithm, which is becoming more and more complex. By the way, this is called the SEO strategy framework. As Neil already explained, EAT, expertise, authoritativeness, trustworthiness. You have to prove to Google that you are that, right? Google's algorithm is getting smarter and smarter. Uh, black hat SEO strategies no longer work. Rank brain, uh, Google started to incorporate uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning into the algorithm. This was a big, 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 big deal. Um, and now basically every search that you do on Google, uh, RankBrain is involved. Um, Neil, do you quickly want to talk about your money, your life? Yeah, so um, Google's business is, is um, or, or should I say Google's usage is based on how much people trust Google's results. Um, and if you think from a risk perspective, if you're looking for a cupcake 
and locally for your kid's birthday and you find the wrong result from Google, it's not going to have a major impact on your life, right? Um, but if you are looking for um, something connected with your money or your life and you end up choosing the wrong credit card or you come across a scam a website that gives you a loan which is actually a big thing in India at the moment and you make the wrong choice you know at the back of your head you're going to go how did I make that choice how did I come across that and so Google's usage is based on people's experience on the search on search results and so it's the risk to Google just goes higher and higher as as uh, people searches relate to your money on your life, which is why if you're in that space, in the health space, your money, uh, money space, insurance, anything like that, you need to work a lot harder than the local cupcake to earn Google's trust. Yeah, well said, well said. Okay. Bert, um, Google is getting better at understanding context, uh, way better at understanding context core web vitals you know how does your website um function is it fast uh, do things load rapidly etc it's all about the functionality of the website the speed of the website mom uh google now pulls information from various different sources um, media languages etc so again that was another leap in terms of you know Google uh, natural language processing, massive update. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, Google unleashed the core update on May 25th. And I'll actually I'll show uh, an example of what happened. That was a big one. They waited about seven months to unleash their um, next core update. So these updates happen, the big ones happen every three to four months and you will see uh, things change if you've been affected by these updates. Whenever they unleash one of these core updates, they announce it, they try to explain sort of like what they did um, with this blog post to me this was the main sentence all right these changes may cause some pages that were previously under rewarded to do better what does that mean google became way better at understanding our content that we put out on the web on our websites right so what exactly does that mean well here we go this is a an example of one of our customers where we created the best possible content that's available on the internet as you can see there on may 25th they saw a dramatic increase in um, visibility traffic etc so these core updates are powerful and you will get rewarded if you put in the effort to develop the best possible content on the web so i hope that's uh, you know encouragement for you guys to put a little bit of effort into content marketing and SEO. All right. Oh boy, Alessandra, uh, one of the, we talked about this at when we spoke in San Francisco, one of the key issues with international SEO silos, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that uh, as you have been consulting with some of these bigger companies? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's amazing even in really, uh, you know, big global companies that have been global and very successful globally for, uh, you know, a long time for many years. It's incredible how internally many functions, many departments still really work in a silo with very little uh, exchange between them. And uh, as we have learned from, from Chris and Neil, uh, you know, SEO requires quite a few components to be set straight, uh, to be done well. And so if you have different, uh, uh, different functions within an organization that are not talking to each other, this can become a big challenge in executing on your international SEO. Um, so what I've learned in, in a few companies that have, that ha have helped me, and I'm not an SEO expert, but I have executed on, on the strategy together with, uh, with, you know, SEO experts within organizations. If we can go to the next slide, please, 
Chris. There we go. Yeah. Uh, you know, it may be a bit basic, but this is important stuff to understand is that, you know, SEO primarily is marketing domain, right? It's even in product focused companies, uh, SEO usually sits with marketing and specifically with digital marketing or digital media. So, you know, if you're looking to, uh, as, a, as a localization professional, if you're looking to um, affect international SEO and contribute to its success, these are the people that you need to go to. Um, normally, uh, people may not think of marketing as a very data-driven function, but it really is, especially digital marketing and digital media is completely data-driven. It's a very data-rich uh, function. This is where all your Google analytics are uh, maintained and, and um, analyzed. So if you're not fluent in the, you know, in this language of Google analytics, go to your digital marketers, go to your uh, uh, digital media people and ask them, you know, ask them to, to help you understand what these numbers means and and how the triggers work so that you can start understanding a little bit more where, uh, where you can impact things. Get a seat at the table. I mean, if your lock function is in marketing, you should be at the table already. And so you should have visibility into these kinds of conversations. If you're not within marketing, just you know, squeeze squeeze your chair at that table and, and, and make sure you're part of the conversation. It's amazing how uh, many uh, internal SEO functions or even SEO agencies that focus on SEO in a domestic market do not know about international SEO. So, you know, when you when you encounter these initiatives within your organization, try to assess the level of international SEO competence of your internal team or your agency. And if they don't have even the most basic knowledge about international SEO, do some education because, you know, it's like everything else with localization. If you think about the international component as an afterthought and you do your whole SEO first, and then you, you try to plug in the international piece only at the end, you're going to pay for it. It's not going to be as good. It's not going to be as comprehensive. You're going to have to backtrack. It's going to take more time. It's going to be more expensive. Um, in very large global organization, there's often regional or local digital marketing functions, or maybe even SEO agencies that the regional offices work with. So make sure you plug into that process uh, to make sure that you're, you know, your strategy is is really trickling down uh, to the local level because if that if that satellite component stays, uh, you know, is a separate uh, component, then of course you're not going to be impactful with with the global international SEO practices that you've put in place. Uh, but as we said, SEO is not only a one function. Uh, uh, operation. Uh, it involves, you know, many different functions. Product functions is also important. So product content matters uh, a lot. So make sure that, you know, when you're looking at your content and you're making sure that it's, uh, you know, of quality, make sure you're looking at your product content as well. So make sure you leverage your term bases, you have your optimized keywords available for, for that content as well. Site structure considerations for international SEO are really, really important. And I think we're gonna maybe dig into that a little later. And then content deployment tools. The, mark, the localization team is usually very uniquely positioned to really understand how content moves around an organization. So uh, when you're trying to deploy the international SEO strategies, plug into those existing processes when it comes to content deployment and tools and make sure that you're connecting the dots in the right places for, you know, for efficiency. Awesome. And I think, uh, let's see, I think Alessandra, you may also want to take the lead on this slide, uh, Global Proof Your Digital Marketing. Strategy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, not nothing like, 
revolutionary here, you know, and I think and and Chris and Neil, you you know, you can speak to this maybe a little bit too. I think a lot of this the SEO exercise is really around diligence, making sure that you do these steps. It's not brain surgery, but if you don't, if you're not diligent about the detail work of putting into your content and your keywords, et cetera, you're just not going to get the results. It's really it's really simple in terms of the triggers that you use and the results that you get. Actually, um, mm -hmm. go ahead. So a, a quick question for Neil. Neil, I think you're working on an Arabic uh, international SEO project right now. Can you talk a little bit about the, the keyword translation versus transcreation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm sure many have heard of the term, but keyword transcreation is the process of taking the English source language keyword that a site is targeting or a brand is targeting and then um, identifying the most relevant keyword for that particular region. And one, one thing that you often find is clients will go, hey, let's target that keyword because it has the highest volume. But actually that keyword is not as relevant to that culture, to that region as another less volume keyword or less volume keyword. So picking the right keyword is so crucial um, when you're thinking about international SEO. It's almost like you're, as you plan the business launch expansion, keyword research is somewhere in there, right at the beginning of your international SEO process, keyword transcreation. And uh, with this particular site that we're, we're talking to, what, what's, what's actually quite interesting is when you are trying to translate um, and localize content for the Arabic market, it actually adds on 15 to 20% in terms of text. So now when you're designing your site, you're doing wireframes and outlines, your English version of your page no longer fits your Arabic version. Like international SEO, a large I would say one of the largest part of international SEO where, sorry, my light keeps going in this office. Um, I don't know why, but it's, it's one of those things that's just, uh, that constantly happens. But um, so one of the, one of the largest uh, uh, portions of running an international SEO project is, is, is having the right language and not just translating it or using some sort of online tool and really thinking about the culture, the localizing it for that particular region. Um, in Arabic, there's different dialects. So you, you kind of have to drill even further and go, okay, which dialect are we going to use? What, who are we talking to? And then there's the whole complication of, hold on, this English text copy can no longer be used or the design for the English text can no longer be used or the, even the, the borders. We now have to rethink this for the Arabic market. So that's why I find international SEO projects really interesting because it's a real combination and looking across that Alessandro was saying, is looking across multiple facets of um, a brand and an audience, not just the keywords, not just technical, not just href lang, but actually looking at the content, the culture um, and, and all of those things. But Neil, may I ask you a question? Because I think this is, I, I maybe I'm misunderstanding, but are you saying that layout also matters and like length of, yeah, the layout of the page yeah. and the length of the page? Because, I mean, those are things that, you know, in localization, we always uh, are concerned about because layout is important, but I didn't realize it actually had an impact on SEO. So absolutely, like layout, I think fits um, design UI UX. Um, let me give you a really bad example, actually. So I was doing a pitch in the UAE recently and uh, to a UAE client. And um, in the pitch deck, we used just a normal woman going to, um, going to the gym. Mm -hmm. And my colleague pointed out and said, hold on, that low cut top, we cannot use that. <laughs> and so it's as simple as, as, as that. Um, it's mm. not just looking at the design and the images, which is that, that's an example of, but it's looking at the entire makeup of that page. 
even even in your head like thinking like what do people want to read what what what's what do we need to tell them in order for them to feel like this has been written and displayed for my culture i feel at home when i'm looking at this page and that's the type of thinking and mindset that you want to have and it goes into the ui the ux the images the layout like i said the even like imagine uh, a web page with now 15 to 20 percent text mm. that doesn't look right like clearly it's not built for that market because no one's thought that hold on arabic text is longer than english text so um Amazing. this is where ui ux and seo need to go hand in hand hmm. so is that what you mean chris when you said that google's much better at context yes great point so basically i think google has figured it out right so google is able to take a look at everything you know um the content the, the context of the content the quality of the content the basic the visual representation of the page google has just made such a massive leap to like very clearly understand you know what a particular page is about and if you're really good at you know like neil just described that really presenting something to the right target audience the way they would expect to see it you will succeed with seo so if we oh. talk about international seo now it's not just seo it's it's all the things that we're discussing everything matters this is why you know, Neil and I are really good at SEO, right? But you, you, uh, you personally, you bring other strength to the table. It truly is a team effort to succeed with international SEO in quotes. That's that's basically my takeaway from these recent mm -hmm. Google algorithm updates. Yeah, it's amazing. You learn something. You know, from these panels, it's yeah. You learn something new, and you know, all the time. It's very cool because, like. You know, layout and context is something that is a localizer you think about all the time, but not in terms of SEO. So, okay, yeah, now it's good to know. It's something that we would do anyway, but knowing this fact gives us ammunition to, uh, you know, convince people of the importance of layout and images and UX, UI for international users as well because that's a constant struggle for us right like putting yeah. in the effort even in the local copies it's not only about translating sure. you know but it's the whole uh it's a yeah. it's a really holistic approach it depends on the size of the project obviously but um what you really want is is if there's a company looking to hire an seo is and they're going into a project like this, you don't just need an SEO, you need the, the content solved as well as UI and UX. And you ideally want all of that to work together in harmony because uh, yes, SEOs will be giving direction, but then um, a localization expert will give the cultural differences and add that to the equation. And then it's how all of that comes together. Well, and I guess I think we need to move forward a little yeah, bit. Yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> <Time for laughs> we could talk forever. Yep. All right. Uh, I'll quickly talk about this slide. Uh, you know, completely translate or uh, and transcreate or not. Uh, I mean, keywords. Yeah, don't just translate. Transcreate. Find the the uh, equivalent in the other language. Uh, then. I mean, Alessandra, maintaining a solid glossary uh, with translated and translated terms, very important. Do you have one example maybe that you can share from like a customer or briefly talk about that? As this yeah, for sure. So um, at ASICS, for example, we, um, we had recently done a, a big uh, SEO exercise around our pronation guide. So ASICS is known for uh, different, uh, for designing shoes for different pronators, you know, runners that pronate uh, uh, in different ways. And we're, we're quite known for this. So we wanted to make this guide uh, uh, an important piece in our content marketing strategy. And of course, pronation is something that runners actually search for a lot, but how is that, you know, uh, described in other in other languages so we went through a big exercise of 
of keyword uh, transcreation, as you said, and, and based it on, on local search volumes. And then we created basically a matrix in our, in our terminology to make sure that when, um, when the keyword pronation was used in English, that the appropriate optimized transcreated keyword uh, was present for, for the different languages. And without that terminology that the linguists or the copywriters could rely on, in some languages, the obvious choice was definitely a different one. So it, it, it would have made a difference in the, in the results. Absolutely. And I guess the key takeaway from this slide is like if you actually put effort into international SEO and content marketing, the localized or international optimized website, it needs to speak to the target audience in, you know, in that market locale, you know, it's like I'm from Switzerland, so I'm Swiss German, I can tell if German content is targeting a, you know, a German German or a Swiss German. That's how detailed this strategy needs to be. Um, yeah, and obviously a lot goes into it, but this is what you need to think about if you put effort into international SEO and global digital marketing. Uh, Neil, did, did you want to add anything to this slide here? No, no, I think you guys covered it. Thanks. Okay, cool. And then, so... Uh, <laughs> Alessandra Neil, as we all know, like localizing, creating content in other languages, it is expensive, it's involved, it takes time, it takes resources, knowledge, uh, etc. Why not start an international SEO strategy with English only, right? Especially if you are a newer company, potentially an e-commerce company that is now ready to sell its products globally. You know, you've done well in the US, for example, but now, hey, why not take a shot at, you know, let's target all of the English speaking market around the world. That's what we did with this customer here. That's a, a real customer example. It's a small barware company. They sell anything from, you know, bottles, uh, tools to make cocktails, etc., including poor spouts. That was one of their um, products that they wanted to push to sell more of. They come to us, they came to us, we developed something that we call micro SEO strategies. We basically identified an underperforming blog post that was already ranking, you know, position 20, 25, 30 for the keyword poor spouts. We eventually developed uh, right there, you can see the organic number one position, the ultimate guide to poor spouts. We completely redesigned, redeveloped this uh, underperforming blog post into the best piece of content on the internet about poor spouts. Basically, the ultimate guide to poor spouts. Not only are we outranking websites such as Amazon, uh, Target, Walmart, etc., in the US. But this piece of content now ranks globally at the top around the world in English speaking markets. So if you don't want to deal with, you know, right away localizing, internationalizing and uh, international SEOing into other languages, you know, start with US, uh, uh, an English international SEO strategy. It's amazing how well this works uh, costs you a lot less money neil um alessandra any thoughts on this uh, strategy it's a good strategy chris um the one thing i was just going to say is when you're targeting a uh, english speaking countries you want to think about your domain and the the architecture of your website so um this is this is almost like the beginnings of an international seo strategy so like chris said this is a blog post that probably doesn't follow any um, any format in terms of the domain, um, you know, uh, name, which is fine for a blog. But the point where you're trying to sell a particular product um, for, say, the UK market, uh, for English people in the UK market or English people in Europe somewhere, then you want to think about how do you how do you give Google enough information to tell Google that this product and this page is for the English speaking market in 
Germany. And that's where you think about .com forward slash, if you're in the US, .com forward slash DE, for instance. Or you might have a strategy in the future where you want to speak to people that are in Germany and they speak German and they search in German, right? And so at that point, now you're looking at a architecture of DE dash DE. Yeah. And, uh, and then you, the, the rest of the pages follow that. So from without complicating this, what you want to do from business point of view is go, where do we want to be and who do we want to be in front of? And then at that point, you want to go work backwards and say, okay, technically, what does my site need? Content, what does my, my, my site need? Culturally, what does my site need in that region? Design-wise, what does my site need? And then they all come together. So I just wanted to give that kind of overarching spiel. Awesome. Thank you. Can I ask a question, though, on this, Chris? Yep. So do you have to do optimization for different Englishes? <laughs> so <laughs> like, are your keywords optimized in this case or, or, so, is it, or is, yeah, or can you just use yeah, one? Good question. Obviously, it, it, it could be a complex answer. Basically with these guys, we know that they want to uh, eventually sell in the UK. Uh, that's the next step. So we uh, optimized the website just for like, global English, but we still told Google, look, our main market is the US. You do this through content marketing, technical things on the back end of the website. But we wanted to go ahead and really get, you know, this page, the attention in other English speaking markets that it deserves. It's basically, um, you know, a, a very broad guide about poor spout, doesn't only target people in the US, primarily in the US. But we're already setting the stage for, you know, when this company is ready to actually sell their products in other English speaking markets, we can make a few changes on the back end in the content to really, you know, ramp it up. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, like. I think it makes sense. At least yeah, right. you're, it's, it's ready to go global. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Whew. Kate, I think at this time, we're gonna do uh, game time, right? Uh, right, I just need to invite someone, my colleague who will help me to share the screen with the game. So I think Oksana will join in a second. Can you please stop sharing because we yeah. will, yeah. Oksana will help me to share. So uh, about the game, uh, basically it's a very simple game. We have just five questions for you. Um, it will be really easy to answer them in case you listen carefully to our experts. So right now I'm sending to the chat. Oksana, can you please stop? Uh, oh, sorry, start sharing. Yeah, thanks. I'm sending the link uh, that you need to use. You can also go to the website menti.com and use the code that you see here. Um, I will do a quick announce for the for our prize. So the person who will answer questions correctly and who will be the fastest one will get this book. Uh, Chris, maybe uh, since you have chosen this book, maybe a couple of words, why you think it's uh, super interesting to read, why it's so useful. I think actually Neil, Neil, I think there oh, was- a I think Neil you. chosen another, okay, maybe I'm mixing up. Sorry, Neil, then. Chris, this is your one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, is that the one? That, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think it provides a really great overview of uh, global marketing. I mean, there's so many bits and pieces that you need to think about. This, this, this uh, book provides a great overview, including, you know, international SEO, localization, mm -hmm. translation, all the stuff that you need to think about. Um, so yeah, I think that's why. It hurts. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Actually, it's not the first time when I see this book uh, suggested from different experts to read. Like I, I've seen it many times and we, we, we have it as a giveaway in our events. So yeah, it's not surprisingly that you have chosen this one. Uh, so let's go to the next slide and let's start our game. Uh, Oksana, can you please? Move forward and let's see who is here. Okay, so we have people joining us. I love these funny images. Yeah. Okay, so guys, let's let's join. Use the link that I sent to the chat, or uh, just go to menti.com and 
use the code that you see on the screen. It's real simple to do with, the, uh, with your mobile phones. Okay, just for 10 more seconds, waiting for people to join and we'll start. Mm, anyone else wants to win the prize? Okay. Okay, so let's start. Um, first question, there will be just five of them. Um, yes, and you need to answer very fast. So which marketing channel offer the least expensive way to generate leads? And here are three options, pay-per-click, social media marketing, or search engine optimization. And you have 10, nine, eight seconds to answer. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Second question, what type of service can you use to translate key website pages and blogs? So you have here four options and all of the above. I just heard someone clicking. Are you, are you also participating, Chris? No? <laughs> okay, so we have right, right answer. Uh, let's move to the next, the third question. How many algorithms updates in Google estimated to make every year? 10 to 20, 200 to 300, 500 to 600, or 900 to 1,000? Okay, great. And I think the last question, oh no, sorry, it's four, yeah. Uh, which of the following is not a Google algorithm update? I think Chris talked about this on the slide. I clearly remember all these names. So is it verb, mom, source, moon? Sorry, it's, it should be moon. I think this is the correct one. Okay, yeah. <coughs> and the last one. Uh, which of these activities does not, does not fall under SEO? Is it keyword transcreation, Google My Business, email strategy, or content strategy? Okay, time is up. Great. And let's see who is the winner. Let's see who got the most number of points. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, so close. And? Wait, is that Chris? Well, I'm not. I'm not uh, it's not you. <laughs> I actually didn't look at the other question. So <laughs> pick the next Mar. Okay, it's Mar. Okay, great. So Mark, congratulate. Uh, you got this prize and yeah, I will contact you and we'll send you this book. Great, fantastic. So Oksana, thank you so much. We can, yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, let's now move to uh, two questions from the audience. Uh, guys, you can use uh, a special section that we have here for questions. Or uh, if you want, you can raise a hand and I will turn on your microphone so you can join us and ask your questions live because sometimes you need to provide a lot of the context and it's really hard to put it in written. So uh, let's wait for the questions. And in the meantime, I think, Chris, do you? Yeah. Let's, uh, let's start with some uh, pre-submitted question. Um, I'm gonna, Neil, uh, what are some other major global search engines? Should we bother optimizing for other search engines? Neil, I'm gonna let you answer this one. And I have some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, so um, I would I would be inclined to go to YouTube. Um, were, maybe, that's, maybe that's not the answer you were looking for, expecting. But, I love it. Yeah. Um, I would go, like, I, I wanna be greedy. I think people should just be greedy. If you can take position one to three on Google, page one, why not take more positions? Because often on Google, you're seeing different formats of content, right? So you're not just seeing the written form, 
If you're seeing videos, create videos. If you're seeing LinkedIn rank, which you are nowadays, or you're in the travel space, you often see um, Pinterest rank, or in the finance space, you see Twitter rank. It, actually, I'm changing my answer slightly. I'm going create content for where create content. So there's two answers here. One is YouTube, just because it's a it's it's a gigantic search engine in itself. And then the other kind of answer tack to this is, depending on your industry, create content, not just in the written form. So do that, do that well, um, but also create content in the format that is ranking on Google for your industry. Like LinkedIn, right? It's a social media platform, but it's also a search engine. So just, I guess, uh, to your point, you know, make sure, think about where your target audience hangs out. Uh, so just, you know, think outside just Google, Yandex, Baidu, et cetera, all the global search engines. There's probably a local search engine, right, to where these people hang out. Love that answer. Let me see. Um... I'm sorry, we have, I think we have a question. And I also forgot to mention very important thing that we have actually a second uh, giveaway for, for the question. I'll just show you. So here is uh, the book that we will, uh, that the person who will ask a question and we will choose this randomly uh, will get. So this is the second book that we have chosen. So please do send your questions and yeah, you have a chance to win it. And in awesome. the meantime, yeah, there is a question. Do you a question, uh, Nisa. Uh, yeah. Would you recommend creating local subdomains, for example, fr.domain.com? Okay, that's the site structure, how we build, uh, internet, you know, set up the success for in national SEO. Alessandra, Neil, like, what are your thoughts before I share my thoughts here? I prefer subfolders over subdomains, um, depending on the resources a company has. Uh, they may want to, or so it's resource dependent and also whether they've got a local office. Um, so larger companies would probably go separate domain, i.e. if you've got a UK office, .co.uk. If you've got a US office, .com. If you've got a German office, .de, right? From a management perspective, that's harder, more complex. However, if you've got the resources and the silo teams managing those various properties, then that may be a better solution. But if I wasn't doing that, I would generally go um, on the same domain, let's say it's a US-based website, goingabroad.com forward slash um, country slash language uh, combination, subfolder. Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree. I think uh, subfolders, you know, language and country subfolders, DE hyphen DE, German for Germany, et cetera, to slap on the .com or the main top uh, country code top level. It's the easiest way to manage an international website. Uh, the most expensive yet the best way to be successful with international SEO is for example, set up a website, you know, dot com for the us and then dot de for germany dot ch for switzerland but man it's a lot of work um yeah so i hope that answers your question nisa may i also add and yep. actually get validation from you guys um because one of the part of the question was also like recreating the pages at the local website isn't that kind of counterproductive? Like if you have already authority and trust on your global site, does it trickle down to your local? So, so if it, you rewrite the locals, like starting from scratch, basically, does, does the, the, the sub folder local page inherit some of the benefits of the global page? I mean, it's, it will sit on a already strong, you know, domain. Yeah. 40 websites, it's going to be yeah. easier to get, you know, new localized content to rank. Neil, what, what's your expertise with so, some of the projects? Yeah, so it just depends. If, you're, um, if, if your question is in relation to uh, us going down the subfolder strategy, which is .com forward slash DE, then the authority lives within the site. Mm. If you're now looking to launch various properties in different domain names, then yes, absolutely. 
you you you've got authority you've got an authoritative website in .com, but that doesn't necessarily mean you've now got an authoritative website .co.uk or .de. So you can transfer authority across by interlinking the websites. However, you are pretty much starting from scratch in that region, um, and this is why I started my answer with, if you have the resources, that is the big if. If you've got the business, if you've got the resources, if you're a large organization, you've got the office, from a business point of view, it just makes sense to do the separate property. Um, it doesn't make sense to confuse your audience that are in the US looking at DE, you know? Um, but uh, what I also found is in certain regions, Chris may um, validate this as well, in certain regions, it's easier to rank for terms in various languages that are non-English languages um, than it is to rank for those same terms or the transcreated version in the US and the UK. So uh, we see a lot of opportunity for, um, for rankings. Uh, and there's my light gone again as well. So I'll end it there. <laughs> cool. I think we're slowly running out of time. So let's get a few more questions in. Uh, but thank you for answering that. Uh, Holly, any tips on marketing for distribution partners in the international space, particularly Mexico or China, are our biggest distribution areas. We've had some trouble with providing the right kind of marketing materials for our partners. Whew, that could be a long answer. Um, any tips on marketing for distribution part? And uh, Alessandra, that yeah, I mean, work with them, you know, learn from them, ask them. Uh, we, at ASICS, again, we work with, with our uh, regional partners very, very closely. They drove the local marketing activities, but of course, the branding, uh, you know, and, and some of the major global campaigns came from global, but the way they were executed locally, it was done by them. So if you have local distributors, I would rely heavily on them to, to kind of tell you what they need and how to execute as well as for SEO. So if there's local agencies that you can get uh, support from, uh, I would definitely encourage that as well. Yeah, you want, you want the main core um, brand location to almost guide the smaller subregions. So there should be brand guidelines, there should be marketing material, marketing guidelines. There should almost be a framework to say this is how we operate, right? And then and then you go out to them and they're not figuring things out. You know what's worked in your region, you know you've got a rough framework. And then what you want them for is to tag on the regional and, and cultural and local expertise. Um, but you need to go there with a the framework so they can put their thoughts into buckets. And if you just go out there and go, hey, could you mark it? The two are not gonna be aligned. So I would say this needs to be owned the responsibility needs to be owned by um, the, the, you know, your company, and then you need to work with partners to bridge the gap. Awesome. Then let's see, pre-submit a question. Uh, what are some tools that we should be using? I'm gonna answer this first. We primarily now use a tool called SE Ranking. Awesome tool, incredible. But of course you also need to uh, use analytic, Google Analytics. Google Search Console. That's basically what we use on my shop here. Neil, Alessandra, any thoughts on that? Alessandra, after you. No, go for it. It's more your realm. Yeah. I don't want to talk about TMSs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so to, yeah, Google Console, Google Analytics, free tools, um, Google Data Studio to see your data, yeah. um, report on it. Um, there's hrefs for good keyword research you can use if you're running a paid ads campaign that's actually the one of the best ways to get actual data um, to see what keywords are actually bringing in money as opposed to just people looking around and shopping around so i'll probably stop there there's probably some some good tools for you i mean we're actually out of time holy cow this this hour flew by uh kate over back to you yeah, thanks. Yes, we actually, yes, all run over time. And since we have only Nisa and Holly uh, asking questions, I, I won't like choose a winner. I will just send books to both of you. 
Uh, thank you for your questions. And thank you so much for your insights, Neil, Alessandra, Chris. I think it was great. And it's actually, it's not enough time. So next time I need to do it like, I don't know, one hour and a half because we can talk about so many things. Um, thank well, you. If, if anybody's interested, I'm actually doing a webinar for Gala. Uh, I'll be talking about international SEO. Um, yeah, so just go to the Gala Global. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much for having us. That was a blast. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Great. thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, and have a nice end of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.